some of what God is doing, I, I want you to hear something that causes our hearts to rejoice and that makes us to know how big God's love is. We may hear a few more things later in the meeting, but Keith, come on up here for a minute. Keith Collins, one of our pioneer grads, is our Dean of Men in the School of Ministry. He was ministering recently at a Native American reservation. He has Native American blood in him. And uh, what happened in that last meeting? How, how, how deep is God's love? In the last meeting, I knew the- Tell him about the atmosphere. Okay, um, when we first got to the reservation, this was up in South Dakota and Pine Ridge Reservation, which is where the Lakota Sioux are. When we first got to the place, we um, felt, you know, some resistance from the people there, of course. And um, God just began to break our hearts immediately for the Sioux people. And just through different things that God used, through feeding them, through going door to door, through just laying hands on them and believing God for healing, God just really began to break down a lot of those walls. And um, in one of the last services, we really saw a miracle take place. I had finished preaching and gave the altar call and I um, had a good altar service, but a gentleman walked up in his early 40s, I would say, just real cold looking in his face. And um, as I approached him, you know, the Lord just really touched my heart and I felt led of the Lord to just embrace this man. And as I did, he began just to weep like a child. And um, I had the privilege of leading him to the Lord. And, I found out after I'd led him to the Lord that he was the great grandson of Chief Red Cloud, and his actual name is Red Cloud as well, who was one of the last great Sioux chiefs that made treaties with the American government back in the 1800s. So by God touching this gentleman, it's supernatural because it opens the door to really reach the Sioux Indians now. So God is, God is awesome, and amen. He can break down walls that we can never even dream that he could break down, amen. Thank you, Lord. Your love is so big. It's so very, very big. It's so awesomely big. We bless you, Lord. Just raise your hands to him and praise him and worship him. Lord, manifest your love and your power in this place tonight. Don't let this be just another service, just another meeting. Don't let it be another night in the Brownsville Revival. Let it be a night, oh God, where we encounter you afresh. Oh God, where our lives are changed out of coming to know you in a deeper way than we've ever known you before. Take the blinders off our eyes and speak to us and meet us. And receive our worship and receive our praise, oh God. Hallelujah. Let's continue to worship and let's press in. Jesus.
There's a fire that can be quenched. There's a love for you as strong as death. Hear us, Lord. Hear the longing of our hearts is to be where you are, not apart. all around us oh lord we want to see your face so take us away the spirit and the bride cry out to you lord we cry out to you come quick Jesus. Deep within, there's a fire that can be quenched. There's a love for you as strong as death. Hear us, Lord. Hear the longing of our hearts.
There's a fire that can't be quenched. Lord, there's a love for you as strong as death. Hear us, Lord. Hear the longing of our hearts. We want to be where you are, not apart. We feel you near, your presence all around us. Oh Lord, we want to see your face, so take us away. Spirit and the bride cry out to you. Lord, we cry out to you, come quickly. We long for the day when we will see your face. We long to be with you, come quickly. And breathe on. Jesus, until you come, and breathe on us, until you come. Come on, worship him. Till you come, oh Lord. Till you come.
Thank you, thank you for the cross, Lord. Jesus, you have taken the cross. Lord, you carried shame for the loss. And in your eyes I see your love. Your body broken, poured out for all. Oh, how wonderful you are. Jesus, you have taken the cross. Lord, you carry shame for the loss. And in your eyes I see your love. Your body broken, poured out for all. Oh, how wonderful.
cross Surrender my all for you, my Lord Cause you gave your life So I give my heart to you, my
tonight. How many of y'all, this is your first week with us? Let me see your hands out there. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, it's good to have you here. It's so good to have you here. Um, if you could go ahead and begin to make your way back to your seats. Okay. Good. You're in the right place then. Praise God. When I first came to the revival over four years ago, uh, little knowing that God would call me right in the thick of things, but when I first came, I remember that I, I was kind of amazed that Partway through the service, at a time of worship and some other things, and then they said, all right, we'll be taking a 10-minute break. I thought, 10-minute break? I mean, I'm from New York originally, and, and I knew this was the South, and I knew the pace was a little slower sometimes in the South, but I thought, 10-minute break? But I trusted the brothers. I trusted that God had been moving here. And sure enough, after the 10-minute break, the Spirit picked off, picked up right where he had left off and continued to move. And, but we're not in a hurry. We, we, want, we want God to move in our midst. We want to pray for everyone that's here tonight. Uh, I got called away to meet with some folks and uh, wasn't able to pray for folks tonight, uh, last night, but I'm eager to do so. And we've got some of our faculty here. You guys ready to join in? Lay hands on folks tonight. Praise God. We got a prayer team ready. Amen. I know you're ready. can feel it. But um, I, I just want to do this quickly. Um, we had a team that just came back from Philadelphia doing outreach before the Awake America there with Steve. Uh, they handed out uh, something like 40,000 flyers. And um, out of those that came to the altar, from what I understand, it was the highest percentage of first-time converts that they had seen at a meeting and uh, powerful altar calls. But the teams, they go out, they go out into rugged areas, and, and sometimes the only thing that keeps them out of an area is police saying, you can't go in here. If a door is open, they'll go for it to reach the lost. And um, just looking at our faculty here, um, John and Pat McCormick, you weren't doing much last month, were you just, how long were you in China for? Six weeks, six weeks in China, uh-huh. And uh, Josh and Toby, where you guys been so far? Germany, Oklahoma, and uh, Bert, what about you and Carolyn? Cameroon, is that in Georgia somewhere? Okay. Somewhere in Africa. You just went for a couple days? Oh, 30 days. You, just you and your wife? And 27 students for a month in Africa. 
What do you know? See, this is what happens when school's out. Our missions director, John Kava, has been gone for six weeks. We may never see him again. He's been all over Europe and meeting up with different teams. Some of the folks here have been out. But here's what I want to do, just, just very quickly or in southern terms, right quick. Uh, any of our students that have been out on any of these trips, we just had some folks come back from Israel. No sooner does our, did our Israel leader get home that he's in Ukraine now with another team. See, we're just consumed with going out, touching the lost. Uh, last night, while you were in here worshiping, going after God, we had people on the streets of Pensacola sharing the gospel. Uh, we're, we're not just here to get blessed. God fills us in here, then we go out and pour it out in the dying world. Amen? But uh, what I want is, is uh, the faculty that's been out any of these trips, just come on up here quickly. And any of the students that have been out, either in local outreach like the Philly team or those that have been to Africa, uh, any of the other missions trips, just join me on the platform here quickly. If you're in the choir loft, just come on down. Most of our students are away for the summer, but uh, we've got a little sampling here. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. It's just a little sampling of almost 1,200. Bless the Lord. Hey, guys. So who is, uh, let's see. You can squeeze in close here. Who is on the, the trip to Philly? Okay. Who is, uh, who is on the trip to Africa? Uh-huh. Well, ha well, hang on. We'll, we'll just, we'll start here. Come here, Dorothy. What, what do you... What are, you, what are you so excited about? Going to Africa. <laughs> we were on this trip for um, about 28 days. And um, it was exciting because I'm moving there in September. <laughs> so it was, it was good to see. I hadn't been to that part of Africa before. And I got to meet the people in, in the ministry that I'm going to be working with, see their vision, which um, is totally God. It's what God has put in my heart, too. We're just seeing how ready and how ripe the harvest is in Cameroon. The people are so hungry and just to, to be taught. And there's so many people who don't even know the Lord, but even the Christians, they don't know. We go into Pentecostal churches and like not even a quarter of them would be full of the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was, it was an awesome, incredible time to, to be with Brother Bart and Sister Kelly because we, we got to learn so much too. You know, we've been through two years of school and then the first half of third year. But I think I, I learned more on how to minister on this 30-day trip because it, was, it wasn't, you know, we, we get a lot of, we have awesome teachers, but we were taught by demonstration. They were doing it and then giving us the opportunity to do it. So it wasn't just we were reading something, we were doing it. And so it was alive in us. It was burning us just to, to minister to these people and pray for them and to see them healed, to see them touched, see them filled with the Holy Ghost. And, and it was awesome. And I, I know I'm never going to be the same. And I got like three months until I go, and I'm ready to go tonight. <laughs> Amen. Now, uh, just a, a quick question here. How, how old are you, Dawson? I'll be 26 next Saturday. 26 next Saturday. All right, everybody remember that if you're here <laughs> next Saturday. And uh, what would you say you were like when, when God brought you to the revival? <laughs> the total opposite of what I am right now. <laughs> I'd only been saved about five months when I started school, and uh, when I got saved, I'd never heard the gospel before, and um, I was totally immoral. I was on drugs, on alcohol, I was violent, I was angry, I was not nice to anyone, <laughs> and uh, never thought I would be here, much less move into Africa to preach the gospel. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's what I wanted you to hear. Thank you, Jesus. Bless you. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Joanne, just come here for a minute. Joanne and John Cava, these, these are, the Cavas are friends for a long time. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm taller than Joanne in case. I see some of you <laughs> trying to measure, trying to figure that out. Oh, she's not wearing her shoes. That's what it is. See, everybody noticed that. Trust me, this is how it is when I go to, you know, overseas to some Asian countries and preach and the translator gets up next to me and everybody starts laughing. We had a translator in Korea insisted on standing on a little wood platform next to me. It still didn't make any difference, but then the way they put the platform, it ended up that I was standing on it, so that didn't help. But um, Joanne was, was with, uh, with John part of the, the time in the, uh, the six weeks, but uh, 
Any, any highlights or anything unusual happen that's worth telling everybody about? Wonderful highlights. Actually, the highlights are, there's so many, I can hardly pick one, but I, of course I will pick the one that's closest to my heart. But uh, I just really want to tell Dr. Brown that the students that are, were with us, my husband has been out now, he has another two or three more weeks. He's now currently in uh, Poland and will be traveling to Czech Republic sometime middle of this week. But he's been, he traveled to Germany and Brussels and France, three locations in France, including Paris. Then we went to Geneva, then we went to Torino, Italy, and that's really the, the one that I want to share. And then, uh, then he went to Poland and then on to Czech Republic. And I just want to let you know the students, which is so incredible, uh, their heart to serve, their willingness to sacrifice. Uh, we had many, many late nights. Sometimes we, we would get in at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning and then have to get up at 7, 7.30 to begin our day in prayer and then morning meetings and on the streets, you know, all afternoons and then back into late night meetings that would start 8, 8.30 in the evening and go until midnight, 1 o'clock in the morning. So, I mean, in every case, the students were just so ready to do whatever you asked them to do. And God moved in every location. Hearts were changed. Lives were set free. Uh, demons come out of people, uh, many, many, many souls saved. We were so incre incredibly blessed to see the hearts of people all around the world ready to receive the Lord. Uh, it's, the harvest is truly ripe, just need laborers to go. That's really, really where it's at. But uh, if I can just share real quick, um, the highlight of my trip was seeing my father-in-law, who is an 80-year-old Italian-American who has been hard to the gospel forever. and. Um, we, would have ne we could have never worked out the details to organize ourselves to be in a location where he was going to be. Just so happened he decided to take a trip to Torino, Italy to visit his brother, who he hadn't seen in many, many years, and it was our uncle that we hadn't seen also in many years, about 20. And uh, through the course of our travels, we landed in Torino, Italy for 10 days, and it just so happened that my father-in-law was at the same location. And uh, we went to go visit our uncle and, his, and our aunt and the children and spent a whole afternoon with, with them, including my father-in-law, who had just arrived in Torino, and spent six hours arguing about the gospel. Uh, it was a really rough six hours. They were so resistant to hearing the word of the Lord. And my father-in-law the whole time remained silent. He never said a word the whole time we were discussing the Bible with our uncle and our aunt. And um, so at the end of the meeting, we really thought we had totally turned them off. And at the end, they said, well, where, you know, where are you speaking to, you know, tomorrow night, John? And he said, well, I'm right in town, about a half hour away. And they said, well, we're going to come see. So they came. The next evening at 8.30, they arrived and sat in one of the hard, hard wooden pews. Uh, with the ministry we were with uh, preaches under, under a large, like a, like a tent. It's a huge tent, like a circus tent. They set it up in different locations in Italy, and they stay there for several months and, and really preach the gospel on the streets. Well, well, anyway, we're under this tent, and my husband's preaching an awesome word, and I'm watching the people next to me. It's my aunt, and then my uncle, and then my father-in-law. And at the end, my husband gives an altar call, and my aunt raises her hand. And so she has MS and can hardly walk forward, so she asked my uncle to bring her forward. And so I'm standing there practically in tears, so excited to see God move. So I slide closer to my father-in-law, who's standing there like this. I mean, like a rock, no expression on his face, just hands to his side, not moving at all. And so I just put my arm around him and give him a little hug and don't say much. And, and my father-in-law speaks very good Italian and he speaks very good English. And he turns to me and he says, you know what? That was a good interpretation of the message. And I said, yes, it was very good. And he said, you know, I heard it twice. I Meaning he heard it in perfect Italian and perfect English. And I said, well, that's really good, Dad. I'm so glad to hear that. I said, but what did the words mean? I'm glad you heard it, but what did it mean? And then his expression changed. I watched this man who has never, like, I think I can count on my hand maybe twice his whole life this man has ever cried. And he stood there like a soldier, and I watched his face begin to crack under the anointing of God. He just began to just break, and his lip began to quiver, and his arms began to shake, and he turned and he looked at me and he said, I have been through war two world wars. He said, I have seen many, many things. I could never believe that God would ever love me and, and forgive me for the things that I have done in my life. And he looked at me and he said, I believe. I believe, and he began to cry and weep and cry. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> well, he 
he fell into my arms. I'm now crying and weeping. My husband has no idea what's going on because he's praying with the people that have just accepted the Lord. And he's weeping and crying in my arms and he says, I have Jesus in my heart. I have Jesus in my heart. And I'm just totally wasted. So finally I was able to drag my husband over and tell him what happened. And, and he just, it was just a miracle. I mean, this man who's been through so much, been so hard, you know, God had to bring him all the way to Torino, Italy. He had to bring us to Torino, Italy for him to finally just really accept the Lord. So we're just so filled with rejoicing before God. You know, let me encourage you, the hardest of hearts can be reached. Just keep believing God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Let me just ask somebody maybe that was uh, stateside, somebody that was handing out flyers and witnessing and in the... Uh, Philly meetings, maybe Barron or somebody else, but why do you, I mean, you need to work and have jobs and other things. Why do you, why do you go and do these things? What's the, well, come here, come here, man, you can. Come and talk to the people for a minute. We just got back from Philly this summer so far. I went to Montana and uh, went to Philadelphia, Oklahoma, and each trip's been powerful. We've had um, Awesome students go out with us. It's been a blessing. Uh, everybody on the team, it's been a really blessing. Demita, Jesse, everyone goes with us, Dennis. But uh, it's just been powerful unity. But we go out there and uh, first off in Montana, it was powerful. We've seen people get, um, I mean, a drug addict come into the revival meeting with needle marks all up and down her arm. An Indian girl, we were on reservations ministering and some Indians came and they were, she was just strung out and I, went to introduce myself to her and she just looked at me and I had my hand out like that and she wouldn't shake my hand, she just looked at me hard, you know. And her sister uh, also was just real hard and at, by the end of the night, his son-in-law preached such a powerful message. They were at the altar and uh, we prayed for him. Demons came out of these girls, they got set free and uh, it was radical. They're on fire for Jesus. I just talked to one of them today and they're on fire for Jesus right now, reading their Bible three hours a day, on fire, preaching the gospel, wanting materials, wanting me to send them tapes. I mean, they're on fire. And I mean, money cannot buy this kind of stuff. And there are people out there, millions of people out there that are in the same condition and there's nobody out there to preach the truth to them. There's nobody out there to reach out to them. There's nobody out there to love on them. They're so hungry. They call me, they write me, they email me because they're so hungry and they just, nobody can relate to them where they're from. No, they can't find anybody who's on fire for Jesus where they're at. And man, I just want more Jesus. I want to be able to touch as many people as I can. We went to Oklahoma, same thing. People got radically touched. Um, powerfully there, you know. I wish we could have did a lot more there. But in Philadelphia, we're out on the streets, and um, I had uh, two girls with me, and, um, and it was just me and these two girls, and we're out in these ghetto areas and just slums, you know. And these guys were looking at us, and they, and they, they go, they go, we believe you guys. You know, we were out there preaching the gospel. We believe you guys are out here in the middle of nowhere, man. And it's crazy out here. And you're with two girls with you. You really believe in this God. We're gonna come to this thing tonight, man. We're gonna come and check this thing out. So we've had people come from the ghetto areas because they, they look at us and they just see something in us and they wanna come, they wanna see what we got. And, and, and then we went into some home right after that and there was a girl in bed just laying there sick, bedridden. She couldn't talk nothing. She was just a vegetable. She was wearing diapers. I mean, she couldn't move. We prayed for this girl and we just seen something light up in her eyes and I just go, and I just started weeping because I, I know there's people all over the place that are like this and there's nobody to preach the gospel to them. And it's just awesome to be a part of the school, to be a part of these teams, be, part, be a part of these awesome teachers that are, that are not, they're, they're putting us before themselves even, that they're laying down their lives for us to be able to do what they do and it's incredible. The love here at the school is incredible. You guys have to experience and be a part of it and support what's going on here. This is a radical thing. I wish more people would see what's going on. People are just blind to what this world's, the condition of this world. You guys got to get out there and check it out and see. I mean, God is breaking our hearts for the lost out here. When we see this stuff, it's an eye opener. You guys got to get out there, be a part of this, get behind it. I would do a lot more if I could, but I, there isn't anybody to help. There's not a lot of people behind us. There's not a lot of support, you know, but we could do all th th things through God who strengthened us. So help us out, people. Get together with us, man. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And there, there are a bunch of burning hearts that are up here, and, and probably everybody's got something they could say, but I just feel that we need to do something. And uh, we are not confirming a calling on your life by doing this, nor are you making 
a commitment where you're signing on a particular dotted line here. And I don't know if we've done things ever like this before in, in a service, but I, I just feel the Lord wants us to do this. There, there's some of you here that, that really believe and sense that God may be calling you out into ministry. Now, please understand, every one of us that knows the Lord is called to ministry. Every believer is called to be a soul winner. Every believer is called to be a prayer warrior. Every believer is called to, to touch a hurting world. But then there are others that we would say are, are in full-time ministry or they feel that they're to, to, to leave other things behind and just give themselves to the work of ministry. And again, we're not prophesying you over you or confirming this by having you stand, but, but there are a number here you feel like, man, I, it could be the Lord. And, and I'm looking out and seeing faces of, of some of our grads here and, and, and they came here as business people with no thought of God and God saved them. And then the next shock was that he called them out. Amen, Randy? Uh, and, uh, you know, we heard about an 80-year-old salvation there. Uh, I, uh, Randy, you're a big guy. Just stand up there. I want the person who is most instrumental in your salvation to also stand up. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, how old was that young lady when, when God used her to touch your life? Nine years old. Got saved at a Baptist youth camp over a summer. Wanted her dad to take her to church, which was a nightmare for him, but he had to do it. And uh, went to a church, heard about a revival, and went to a Baptist church, heard about revival in Pensacola. God called him here, unsaved, saved him, and uh, sending his whole family out to Phoenix. Work with children. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. But if, if you feel, if you feel distinctly, now hear me, every one of us could say, I know there's more, I want more of God. And by the time I finish the message to that, I believe there'll be something deep calling many of you. But if you're just sitting here and, and you say, I know there's more God wants me to do, I feel there's ministry he wants me to be involved in, or he wants me to, to get involved in full-time ministry, he may be calling me out to your school or a place like that to train, or I, I just know there's got to be something night and day more than where I am right now, and, and whatever it takes, Whatever the cost or the consequence, I want God to push me into that. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet, and we're going to pray. Our, our students that are here are going to pray. The others uh, in the pews, we're just going to pray, and I'm going to ask a few faculty or, or students or grads, just a couple, to take the mic and pray that God would release his calling and bring you into what you're supposed to be. You may have come here for one reason in your own mind, but God may have brought you here for a totally different reason. All right? So if, if I'm talking to you, right now, those things that I said, and, and maybe God's causing you to question a lot of the plans that you had been making, a lot of the career goals that you had, or the things that were set before you, and you feel, man, there's got to be something radically more. I've got to give myself to minister. I, I, I know there's something out there beyond what I've been. Why don't you stand to your feet quickly? Just stand to your feet if you're really serious about this. All right? Thank you, Jesus. All over the balcony. You may be listening, friend, by radio, and you said that you didn't talk to the people by radio. Well, we're talking to the people by radio. You make yourself known right where you are. If you can stand up, if you're not driving, stand up. If you're driving, just sit up real straight. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Everybody, let's stretch our hands towards these people. Let's all begin to pray, and then I'm going to give the mic to any of you folks, just two or three that want to come and pray. Thank you, Father. Mighty God, look down at these people. Father, you brought them here for a purpose. Some of them, Lord, this was the last thing on their mind 24 hours ago, but now something's stirring. Some of them, Lord, for many months have been crying out. Some of them are taking steps to make a life change, but they know what it's going to cost. Lord, all those that are hearing your call, all those that are hearing your voice, push them out. Push them out to the next level. Bring them to the place they need to be, Father. Open every door that's of you. Shut every door that's not of you. Remove the fear, Father. Jesus, let's cry out to God. Let's lift our voices to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Some of you just come and take the mic here on the platform. Jesus. Lord God, I just pray now for those who are standing here and are shocked 
by the fact that they're standing, that it have never crossed your mind before, but God spoke to you. This isn't an impulse. God has never done anything on impulse. And I'll tell you right now, we had this plan for you. You are here to hear this invitation tonight if you hadn't known it before. And if anybody here is being told by the enemy right now or by themselves, their own mindset that they're too old to move forward in the service of their God, they're too set in their ways, then think again because you're never too old to serve Jesus Christ. He's calling you now because he needs you. He has a work for you to do that nobody else can do. Realize that. He has put this in your heart because he needs you. Father God, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit has talked about this and said tonight will be the night that we will invite them. Say yes to God. Go deep in the word. Go deep in your prayer life and say, God, I am available because it is his call on you tonight, not Dr. Brown's. Praise Jesus for this. Amen. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Just stay before the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Anybody else on the platform? The Lord's laying on your heart something. Jesus. Father, I thank you for the call of God that's on people's lives in this place, Lord Jesus, that you don't choose the wise of the world, Lord. You don't choose the strong, Lord. You choose the foolish things, God, and the weak things to confound the wise, to confound the strong, Lord God. All you need is a willing heart, Father. And I pray you take these willing hearts, Lord Jesus. You take the sacrifice that's been laid, laid on your altar tonight, Lord God, and that you kiss it with your fire, Lord God. That you put a burden in hearts tonight, Lord God. That you put a vision of the lost in hearts tonight, Lord God that you would stir up the gifts of God in hearts tonight, Jesus, that people in this place would never be the same, that the fire of God would touch them tonight, Lord God, Lord, that you would confirm the things that you have for them, Jesus, that it wouldn't be a confirmation of man, but of the spirit, that you would speak to their hearts, God, that you would put people groups on their hearts, Lord God, that you would put places, God, that they would find themselves weeping over people like they've never wept before, Lord Jesus. I pray, Lord God, you do something so radical, exceedingly, abundantly, beyond everything they could think or ask or imagine with their lives, God. I pray, Jesus, that they never miss the things they lay down, God, because it's so awesome to serve you, Jesus. Bless their lives, Lord God. Kiss them with your fire, Lord God. Kiss them with your presence and use them to glorify Jesus. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Why don't you just lead them in a next step prayer? All right, Josh? Four words for you. Respond to the call. Respond to the call. You, you've made a step by standing up. The next step is go do something. God not only challenges you to stand up, he challenges you to walk. Respond to the call. I responded just like you did 27 years ago. God has never forsaken me. He's never embarrassed me. He's never let me down. I chose to serve him, but I was scared to death 27 years ago, standing where you stand right now, wondering, what will God do for me? What will God do for me? How can I serve him? Well, you do this. You put one foot in front of the other. Yeah. You respond to the call. Take the next step. Be willing. Take the challenge. Take the next step. God can take you places in the spirit world and in this lifetime that you'll never really understand unless you take that next step. Do something. You must do something. You can't just stand up and say, well, here I am, God. I'm weak. I'm miserable. I'm poor. I'm the least. But so did Gideon say that. So did Jeremiah say that. So did Moses say that. I can't speak for you. But if God's caused you to stand now, he has a place for you. He has a place prepared for you. You take the next step. If God's saying, come, how many of you are ready to take the next step? You're just standing here now. You say, I want to take the next step. I'm ready for the next step. All right, Jesus. Jesus, you see these hands. Lord, show them how to take the next step, oh God. Release them from the ways of this world and the lifestyle they're in and show them a glimpse of glory, a glimpse of your grace and of your glory of what you can do with their lives, Jesus. Father, help them to take the next step. We challenge the spirit world to release them in Jesus' name. Release their gifts. Release their anointing. Release the calling that God has put upon them. Now you receive it in Jesus' name. And as he speaks to you, if he says, go sign up for the school, then you go. And don't hesitate. 
There's an old missionary rule that I've come up with for years and years. It says, he who hesitates waits. And you can wait, 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 and wait, and wait until you're old and dead. God is doing such tremendous things with people today. He has so much work that needs to be done. These have accepted the challenge. You take the next step. God will take you with the next step because he guaranteed you in his word. I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. So get that in your heart. Get that in your spirit. In those four words, respond to the call. Everyone just say this out loud with me. Heavenly Father, I want to do your will. Whatever that means, whatever the cost, whatever the consequences. If you lead, I'll follow. If you speak, I'll obey. I'm yours, Lord. Use me however you see fit. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Everyone just thank God together. Just raise your hands and thank God together. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Jesus. Bless you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Why don't you all sit down? Thanks, guys. I just wanted your presence up here. Miss seeing all of you. And as uh, soon as you're sitting, well, let me make these announcements quick, and then we're going to press in a little deeper. Worship team, if you guys would be ready. Everyone that's going to be in town next week, we want to invite you to our summer sessions that will be held here in the main sanctuary, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. 11 to 1, and then 2 to 4 in the afternoon. We're going to have a super week. Uh, normally, we charge between $70 and $90 for a summer class, but we've opened it up completely free to the general public this summer. Uh, we've had a, a two really good weeks so far. Uh, the teaching's been rich. Uh, hearts have been open and challenged. And one of the men that God sent us, uh, an old friend of mine, uh, S.J. Hill, he was Steve Hill before he got here, but since we already had a Steve Hill, uh, we asked him if he had any initials, so uh, he's been SJ to us. But his teaching on the love of God and the Father heart of God has really radically impacted our student body. And uh, he's going to be talking next week on cultivating intimacy with God. It's going to be a great class. And then Larry Tomzak, who's full of life, full of the, the enthusiasm of Jesus. Uh, we talked to him about what was on his heart to teach. He's going to fly in from Atlanta for the week. Uh, he's going to teach on rediscovering Jesus. So uh, these classes are, are free and open to the public. And if you want to come, just get here about quarter to 11 on Tuesday. Whatever day you come, just come a little bit earlier so you can sign up and we can have your, your name and record of your being here. And uh, Lars, just come on up here real quick. Lars is a dear friend, the Swedish brother that God has planted in Israel, a man whom I love and respect. He hosted the tour that we were just with um, in April in Israel. And uh, he's here in Pensacola. He's going to be having a, a special conference uh, in, a, in a bit also. But uh, just, just real quick, I'll, I'll give the background. But there's a city in, in Israel called Safat. Uh, you may see the Safed on your map. It's, it's been a world center of Jewish mysticism. And, and part of it is really new agey. And, and, and others is very orthodox, Jewish, mystical. Uh, I went into one of the, the famous synagogues there, one of the, the, the best-known leaders, and the synagogue is, is painted kind of a blue-green to keep the demons away. I mean, there's a lot of weird stuff. And every year, I didn't even know about this, but multiplied tens of thousands of Israelis gather together for a mystical celebration in which all kinds of, of, of things go on, some of which are actually weird and perverse. And uh, Lars had his tour group there, but this was a prayer tour. They were there to pray and intercede. And the theme of his conference was the God who answers by fire is God. And a couple days before I arrived, they, they were there and they, they got to go up in the heights of, of uh, Safat with their, their, their tour group. And um, Lars had just served communion and was kind of overcome by the Spirit and was reading this, this declaration of independence, this, this challenge to the spirit world and this proclamation of liberty. And, and we've seen it on video. It's, it's an amazing thing, but you were there firsthand. What, what happened? Well, uh, all of a sudden, people began to shout and scream and point towards heaven. And it was a clear blue sky. And God has spoken to us when we started the prayer session that, that the stars will fight from heaven today. 
And all of a sudden, uh, I, everybody started to jump and scream and point towards the sky. There was in the clear blue sky uh, some, something that looked like a cloud of fire. And in this city, they are worshiping the fire that Elijah prayed down from heaven. They lit bonfires on this mountain. Uh, it's the largest religious gathering in all of Israel. Over 200,000, Dr. Brown. Every spring, they lit fires there. Uh, and, and this fire came, the real fire came from heaven. Hallelujah. Right over the city. It was seen all over Galilee, out towards even the Mediterranean. And, and uh, I believe it was Tommy Tennis' uh, personal intercessor was with us on the tour. She just grabbed me and said, I would never believe I would live to see something like this. And uh, it was awesome. <laughs> the, the funny thing on the video is that Lars was so intent on reading what he was reading and he's so overcome that, uh, that you see on the video, it looks like a bunch of second-rate actors and actresses because it's so exaggerated you see all of a sudden oh they just they all just start pointing in there and you hear them laughing like, whoa and they're trying to get his attention he's just trying to read this thing and they're like pointing just jumping up and down behind him and pointing up and he's probably like whoa jesus the god who answers by fire is god amen <laughs> hallelujah hallelujah so just given the dates and the times for the Israel meetings? Yes. We're going to have a conference to raise up more intense intercession for the salvation of Israel this coming weekend, starting at, uh, on Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock and then all day Saturday. We will, uh, of course, attend the revival services at night. But we welcome every one of you. It, there's no fee for this either. And it will be in the Blue Room over at the campus or maybe the orange, whatever, it's going to be at the Brownsville Revival School of Ministry campus uh, out there. And uh, 3 o'clock on Friday it begins and then all day Saturday. But God has put on my heart the, that the battle is intensifying over Israel. And this summer we must see a new uh, level of intercession begin to be raised up in the body of Christ worldwide. We're set on seeing revival come to Israel. We're set on seeing the fire of God and the Spirit of God begin to fall. And uh, come join us and we will have a great time. God bless. Amen. Thank you. Bless you. Would you all please stand? If you need information about the school or anything, grab a brochure on the way out. You can get on the school's website, Brownsville Revival School of Ministry, BRSM, brsm.org, and get info. You've got to be serious. You've got to be committed. You've got to be living holy, willing to lay your life down for the gospel. And the Lord's raising an army up. But if you need any info about things next week, just grab one of those brochures. Uh, Heike, would you just come up here? Okay, thank you, Jesus. Just stay right where you are. Don't come up. That's okay. Thank you, Jesus. I'd asked if she might be able to uh, lead us in worship with one song, but uh, her throat's hurting tonight. So you can sing it, man. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Open your hearts. The Lord's been challenging me to challenge you. I've been on my face asking him to speak to me as I speak to you. Let's, let's let the Lord go deep. Amen.
your sacrifice I pour out my heart And I give you my life I offer up to you, O oh Lord This costly gift With absolute abandon Now my love I confess And as we draw near, as we respond, honor your promise and draw near to us. May we know you in ways we've never known you before we leave this place tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. Thanks. As you're seated, turn with me to Revelation chapter 2. The book of Revelation 
chapter 2. The question I'm going to ask at the beginning of this message may surprise you. You may wonder, well, how many will it really apply to here? So many seem on fire. So many seem zealous. So many seem excited about Jesus. There's free worship. There are people on their knees, on their faces before God. There are people dancing and celebrating. There are many responding and saying, I believe God is calling me into his service and ministry. When I ask this question, you may wonder, I wonder who this applies to. As I get into the word, you might realize that it applies to you. The simple question is this, are you backsliding? Are you backsliding? Revelation chapter 2 these are the words of Jesus that were delivered to seven different congregations, seven churches in Asia Minor. And the first of these was Ephesus. Ephesus was a city where Paul poured himself out and over a three-year period ministered to the Ephesians and warned them with tears of coming danger. Ephesus is a city that was graced with one of the New Testament epistles. Ephesus was well known in the ancient world. As a result of Paul's ministry there, a riot broke out. So many people were getting saved that it hurt the idol business. Not as many idols were being manufactured anymore. And there was now a threat to the false gods and goddesses. God moved there powerfully. And Jesus speaks first to the church in Ephesus and then goes just in a little circle to all seven. If you look at it on a map, you'll just see this little circle. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. When I got saved in 1971, I thought all of the people in the church had always been saved. I knew my friends that had just come to the Lord and brought me to the Lord were brand new in the Lord, but I thought all the others had been saved all their lives. I remember there was a, an older brother in his early 60s, full of zeal and faith and fire. I was just 16 then, an Italian brother. Most everyone in this little church was Italian. And, and he was always charged and encouraging and exhorting. The night I, I asked the Lord into my life, he came up to me after the service with another brother in his early 60s, and he said to me, remember, no matter how close the devil is, Jesus is always closer. I had no idea what it meant. I learned quickly what it meant, but they were always encouraging and, and, and feeling full of energy like young men. But it was winter when I got saved, November, December of 1971, when I got right with God. And when it got a little warmer, and this fellow had his jacket off, he had a short sleeve shirt, and he had tattoos on. And I realized that he did not get those tattoos in church. And when I began to find out his testimony, he was in trouble with the mafia. He had been on a chain gang for a while before he was saved. I was amazed to hear the testimonies, the conversions, the radical stories, how this one was changed, and that one was changed, and that one was changed. And then I heard a tragic thing. One of those two older brothers, they used to call him Brother Trixie because when he was a boy, he always played tricks on the people in church. He would get these stray alley cats and throw them in a church building just to disrupt the service when he was a little boy. They called him Brother Trixie and the name stuck, Trixie, and then when he got saved, he became brother. Everybody was brother or sister. The pastor was Brother George. I remember talking to a rabbi friend of mine as a new believer and, and 
I said something about Brother George. He said, who's Brother George? I said, well, that's the pastor. He said, the pastor's Brother George? I said, yeah. He said, that's what you call him? I said, yeah. It sounded strange to him. That was like a monk's name or something like that to him. And then we talked a little bit longer, and I said something about Brother Rudy. He said, Brother Rudy? Who's Brother Rudy? I said, oh, he's one of the real neat guys in the church. He's the pastor's brother. He said, Brother Rudy? I said, yeah. I said, well, that's what we call him. And then he looked at me with a smile. Remember, I'm Jewish. Here's a rabbi talking to me. He says, are you Brother Mike? <laughs> yeah, I'm Brother Mike. Then I found out about Brother Trixie's brother. He came to church one day. Sad looking man, a man that looked like he had been drinking a lot through the years, and I found out he's a backslider. He's a backslider. A backslider. He used to know the Lord. He used to walk with God, and he backslid. He's been an alcoholic. He's been back and forth. He's been up and down. I thought, wow, a backslider. It was this phenomenon. I first met somebody. That was a backslider. And I remember talking to him once, and he just wanted us to know, this, the young people, he wanted us to know how hard it is to come back after you've fallen away, how hard it is to get steady and get stable. And, and, and I thought, how terrible. And then I knew of others that had walked with God and turned their backs on God. And I just kind of looked at it like this. You're walking with God, and then you turn from him, and, and you backslid, just like that. Now that Steve's not here, I have to take up the slack with some dramatic illustrations. <laughs> I remember one service, the pastor made a statement. He said, it may take a man 20 years to backslide. And all of a sudden, I saw things differently than I had seen them before. I realized how much backsliding was a process. That, that you may come to that point where suddenly you go over the edge. Suddenly you're back to drinking. Suddenly you're not believing anymore. Suddenly you've dropped out of church. Suddenly people don't see you anymore. You're living with someone out of wedlock. You're back to gambling. Something's happened. The, the obvious outward vices are there. You, you've gone over the line. You don't want anything to do with God, it seems. But it may have taken you 20 years of one little step after another, one little step after another, one wrong decision after another, one bit of hardness after another. It may have taken 20 years before you got to that place and fully turned away from God. I want you to see something here in Ephesians, in, in, in the words to the Ephesian church here in Revelation 2. Look at what Jesus says. I know your deeds, verse 2 your hard work, and your perseverance. This is scary to read because Jesus is about to rebuke them and say the thing that's most important to him is what they have left behind. Many times we misquote the word of God. The King James says you left your first love. Many of us misquote it and say you lost your first love as if it's something you just misplaced somewhere. Where are the keys? I don't know, I lost them, I put them down somewhere. You don't lose your first love, you leave your first love. It's not something that just accidentally gets misplaced. Things are done. When you finish the meetings here, you leave Pensacola. You don't lose Pensacola. Where am I? I'm in New Jersey. What happened? I lost Pensacola. No, you leave Pensacola and you travel there. You get on a plane, you get on, you get on a train, you get in a car, you make certain decisions, you go a certain place. Jesus says you have left, not lost, you have left your first love. But here's what scares me. Look at what he says about him. I know your deeds. And he doesn't say they're filthy, they're unclean. You're a lazy bunch of, of good for nothing. He doesn't say that. He says, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I want you to consider this. You can leave your first love and still be a hard worker for the Lord. You can be gradually backsliding and still be zealous in many outward areas. You might even be sacrificing for Jesus and backsliding all the while. Your sacrifice for the Lord today may be greater than it was 10 years ago, and yet you may be farther from Jesus today than you were 10 years ago. I know your hard work and your perseverance. 
Perseverance is a sign of commitment. Perseverance is a sign of, of, of moral fortitude. I'm not going to back down. I'm not going to quit. It's a sign of courage in the face of opposition. When others are cowardly, when others turn their backs, when others say, I can't make it, not these people. They persevered. You say, well, that was their history up to then, and now they've just fallen away. No, we say, you've been doing this, you are doing this, this is your history, but in the process, something has gone wrong. You can be committed, immovable, unshakable in many areas of your life. You can refuse to compromise in many areas of your life. You can say, others may quit, others may drop out, I'm not going to drop out. Others quit going on the streets preaching, I'm not stopping. Others are going their own ways and watching these foul movies, I'm not compromising. You might be persevering and at the same time leaving your first love. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to, to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You can be doctrinally zealous. You can love pure truth from the word. You can hate charlatan stuff. You can hate sensationalism. You can hate flaky preaching. You can discern the difference between the true and the false, between the real and the counterfeit. You can have a zeal for the foundations of the faith. You can be grieved over doctrinal error. And all these things are important to the Lord. And the Lord is commending the church of Ephesus for all these things. And if, and if these things describe you in the same way, he's commending you or he's commending me for these very things. These are important to God. These are not trivial small points. Jesus is not just setting them up for the kill. He's telling them the truth. Sardis, there's very little he can say that's good about him, except you've got a few in your midst that have not soiled their garments. Laodicea at the outset, he can't say anything good, just a promise of restoration if they'll repent. So he means what he says. These are not just empty compliments. It's important to the Lord, but you can be a doctrinal sharpshooter. You can be one who is so zealous for truth. You can be one who says, man, I, I can't tolerate these messages that are being preached that are that are just so self-centered and get our eyes off God and get our eyes off souls and, and just tell us what's in it for me. I hate that. It grieves my heart. You can be like that. You can be one of those that is just a stickler for the word. And at the very same time, at the very same time that you are exposing error, at the very same time that you are correcting those who are going in the wrong direction, and maybe leading your flock as a pastor away from error and into truth, at the very same time, you can be leaving your first love. You have persevered, he says it again, second time, and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. To tell you the truth, Many of the symptoms that we look for as signs of backsliding would seem to be the opposite of these things here. We, we would assume, well, if you're backsliding, you're not working hard. If you're backsliding, you're not persevering. If you're backsliding, you're tolerating error and you're getting compromised in your doctrine. If, if you're, you're backsliding, you're not going to endure a hardship and you're going to grow weary. And in fact, those often are signs of backsliding, but none of them applied here to Ephesus. This could be spoken of a church as a whole, as the Lord is speaking here. It can be spoken of individuals. It's sobering. Yet the thing that grieves the Lord, in spite of all the good, in spite of all the excellent things, in spite of their faithfulness in ministry and their zeal for truth, in spite of all that, he says, I hold this against you. When I began studying the book of Jeremiah in greater depth than I ever had a few years ago, getting ready for a commentary that I'm writing on it, as I was studying it and, and, and getting just into the early chapters, I was struck by how deeply hurt God was by his people's disobedience and unfaithfulness. 
how shocking it was, how appalling it was. Because he's God, he can't just ask for human witnesses because he's God. So he, he tells the heavens, be shocked over this. Heaven and earth, universe, stop and look at what my people are doing. They're forsaking me, the fountain of living waters, and hewing out for themselves cisterns that have no water, broken cisterns. They're forsaking life and they're embracing sin and perversion and death and everything unclean. Be astonished at this. And you could feel in the words how it hurt God. One thing we've got to realize, we've got to take hold of, is that our attitudes are often more important than our actions. That right attitude will lead to right action, no question, but there might be right actions and wrong attitudes of the heart. Didn't Jesus rebuke religious leaders in his day in Matthew 23 and other passages, telling them that outwardly they were so clean, but inwardly like dead men's bones? Jesus says, I hold this against you. It is personally offensive to him. It is something he takes personal issue with. It is something that upsets him on a personal level. Why? Because his greatest concern is his relationship with us. His greatest concern is not that we succeed. His greatest concern is not that we are awesome producers of great works and so on. His greatest concern is the depth of our relationship with him. His greatest concern is that we know him more and walk with him more closely. I remember many years ago, an elder in a church where I was serving, he was talking to us, other leaders in the church, and he quoted 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you in the King James. And he said, notice it doesn't say, for he cares for the work, it says, for he cares for you. We sometimes think God's main concern is for his work. His main concern is for the things that we do. Those things matter to the Lord. He has ordained that we go and bear fruit and bear much fruit and bear fruit that will remain. And we'll, we, we will be judged and we will give account on that day for what we've done. But his deepest desire, the thing that matters to him the most is his relationship with us. And Jesus says, I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. You have forsaken your first love. Let me read you something that Charles Finney said many years ago. Show me a young convert while his heart is warm and the love of God glows out from his lips. What does he care for the world? Call up his attention to it, point him to its riches, its pleasures, or its honors, and try to engage him in their pursuit, and he loathes the thought. But let him now go into business and do business on the principles of the world one year, and you no longer find the love of God glowing in his heart, and his religion has become the religion of conscience, dry, meager, uninfluential, anything but the glowing love of God, moving him to acts of benevolence. I appeal to every man in this house, and if my voice was loud enough, I would appeal to every professor of religion, anyone who professes religion in this city. And if anyone should say, no, it is not so, I should regard it as proof that he never knew what it was to feel the glow of a convert's first love. Let me first speak to those of you here who might say, I'm saved. I'm sure if I were to die right now, I would go to heaven. But I don't think I know what you're talking about when you're talking about first love. I don't think I know what you're talking about. When, when I hear a quote by Charles Finney and he's talking about glowing with that love, I don't really understand what you're talking about. Or maybe you're here listening by radio and you realize I don't really know the Lord. I've been in church, I've heard the gospel, but I don't really know the Lord. Let me read a passage to you. You don't have to turn there, but in Song of Songs, in Song of Songs, the fourth, the fourth chapter, there is dialogue between the lover and the beloved. And it, it continues on. There, there are others, the friends, that go on in the fourth and in the fifth chapter. In fact, we'll jump right in, in the fifth chapter. The lover comes and knocks on the door but the, 
the bride-to-be sleeping, doesn't get up in time. And when she stirs, she, she begins to go out in the city, I've got I've to find them, I've got to find them, I've got to find them. The ancient rabbis took this as a picture of God and Israel. The believers in Jesus began to see this as a picture of Jesus and the church. And here he is knocking and, and calling and the bride, the people of God, go after him. And, and she says in verse 8, O daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you, if you find my lover, what will you tell him? Tell him I am faint with love. And then the friends, I mean, they don't really understand this. What's so big about this guy? What, what's so big about this Jesus? What's so exciting about him? Aren't you overdoing it a little bit? I found Jesus. I'm saved, praise the Lord. Aren't you getting a little overexcited about this bumper stickers now, t-shirt, you don't go out and do all the things you used to do anymore. I mean, aren't you getting a little fanatical about it? Now you want to be a missionary. I mean, who's, what's about this Jesus? Who is he? Verse 9, how is your beloved better than others? Most beautiful of women. How is your beloved better than others that you charge us so? I mean, what makes him so special? There are a lot of nice religions in the world. There are a lot of good Christians in the world, but they're balanced. They're not fanatical like you. They're not obsessed with him like you. They don't talk about being desperate for him and longing for him. What makes him so special? And she says, my lover is radiant and ruddy. Outstanding among 10,000, his head is pure as gold, his hair is wavy and black as a raven. His eyes are like doves by the water streams washed in milk, mounted like jewels. His cheeks are like beds of spice yielding perfume. His lips are like lilies dripping with myrrh. His arms are rods of gold set with chrysolite. His body is like polished ivory decorated with sapphires. His legs are pillars of marble set on bases of pure gold. His appearance is like Lebanon, choice as its cedars. His mouth is sweetness itself. He is altogether lovely. This is my lover, this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. And they say, where has your lover gone, most beautiful of women? Which way did your lover turn that we may look for him with you? If that's who he is, if he's that wonderful, if he's that special, we'll come along with you. We want to find him too. Maybe you've never really known him. Maybe you've never really experienced him. You have to ask yourself, can you say, he's all the world to me? Can you freely say, Jesus, you're all I want. You're all I've ever needed. Can you freely and honestly say, Lord, if I had everything in this world and I didn't have you, I'd be empty. It would be death itself. But if I could have you, even if I lost everything else, I'd be alive. Can you really say, I love to worship you, Lord. I love to be in your presence. I long for you. I can't wait for your appearing. I can't wait to see you. I can't wait to be with you forever. Maybe you've never been able to say that, that either you've never known him or your knowledge of him is very superficial. And tonight, I challenge you to take the plunge. See, Jesus makes no halfway contracts with anyone. Jesus doesn't say, give it a try for six months, and if you don't like it, you get a money back guarantee. He doesn't say, sell your possessions, give to the poor, and if it doesn't work, I'll pay you back. He says, come follow me. You see, he was so awesome. He was so wonderful. He was so extraordinary. The crowd's just pressing to get near him and touch him because of who he was, taking the roof off a house to just bring a sick person to him. He was so extraordinary that when he just said, follow me, you, 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 follow me. They dropped everything. They dropped their livelihoods. They dropped their other responsibilities. And next thing they were just following him. Where did he go? Where did he go? We got to be with Jesus. I want you to understand he's the same Jesus today. It's not just someone we read about in a book. He's a living Lord. He can be our best friend. We can really know him better than anyone in this world. We can really relate to him in ways that no one else can understand. Even a husband and wife with all the shared intimacy, with all the shared heart-to-heart -heart relationship can still have some places in their lives and they know only God understands them. They can communicate totally openly and share their feelings fully and then still you hit a wall and it's only God who understands. If you don't know him like that, I tell you, the door is wide open tonight. The door is wide open for you to step out of that superficiality and to step out of that dead religion and to step out of that man-made substitute 
to step out of the shallow waters and to take the plunge. And when you take the plunge, friend, it's wonderful. You ever been with somebody that was afraid to, to jump in the water and they just, they just didn't want to jump and they just, they just didn't want and they waited and they waited and they waited and you're frolicking there and having fun, little kids playing and finally they jump and next thing you hear them laughing and splashing and giggling and they can't wait to go and jump again. Whoever drinks of the water that Jesus gives will never thirst for any other water, will never want some other water. When you drink from his fountain, when you keep yourself nourished at his fountain, you don't go looking for other fountains. You don't even think about other fountains. Things that consumed your life that were your very source of identity, your very source of, of mission and purpose and fulfillment. When you drink of the waters of Jesus, you forget those things ever existed. They don't matter because of him, because of your encounter with him. Some of you started there. Some of you once had hearts ablaze for him. I was seeking the Lord the other day and something struck me. In many people's eyes, I'm somewhat radical. When I preach just a basic biblical message and a basic biblical calling to follow the Lord by life or by death, to some that's radical. When we talk about revolution, when we talk about shaking a generation, when we talk about our blood for the gospel, our blood for souls, when we talk about these things, some people think, man, that's radical. And as I was praying and reflecting before the Lord, this thought rose up in me. You can be radical and backsliding at the same time. You can be committed, you can be devoted, you can be zealous in many ways and still in other ways be backsliding. I know if we were honest that every one of us would have to find some area in life that was stronger at one time than another. I understand that. I fully understand that in that sense, spiritually speaking, not every muscle will be equally exercised all the time. But I want to go deeper than just one little area here or one little area there. And I want to ask you some questions. I want you to challenge yourself. And the Lord himself is saying to some here, I have this against you. You're out on the mission field, but I have this against you. You're leading a Sunday school class, but I have this against you. You're known as the most on fire kid in your school, but I have this against you. Everyone thinks you're a godly mom, but I have this against you. Why does he have it against us? Because he cares about us. Because he's jealous for us. If there's love, there's holy jealousy. When you really love someone and they're unfaithful, it rips your heart out. That's why God used such graphic terms in the Hebrew Bible when talking about his people's unfaithfulness to him, they were having adultery. It was like, the people of Israel were his bride and they were committing adultery with every man they found out in the street and paying the man for doing it. It was so offensive, so painful to the Lord. But in the love of God, he doesn't condemn anyone here. In the love of God, he's calling. His mercy is so infinite. He is so incredibly long-suffering. I remember many years ago when there was a girl back and forth, back and forth, back and forth in the Lord, she said to a friend of mine, it's a good thing you're not God. It's a good thing all of us are not God. God's mercy is incredible. His patience with us, slow to anger, great in mercy. And in his mercy, he's calling us. In his holy jealousy for us, he's calling us. And he's saying, remember the height from which you've fallen. Remember the height from which you've fallen. What I'm going to say is going to speak to different people in different ways, but wherever the Spirit of God nails you, wherever the conviction of God hits, wherever that irresistible pulling of God rises up, don't resist Him. Don't fight Him. Some of you put up walls unconsciously because you got hurt, you got burned, because you took a step and things didn't pan out, because people let you down. Maybe you just disappointed it yourself. Maybe you, you're not ready for the discipline that it means to follow the Lord, the challenge that it means. Maybe you're not willing to, 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 to pay the price, suffer the consequences of obedience, maybe losing friends, maybe having people turn against you. Maybe leaving that comfortable lifestyle and going out to do something that others would call radical. I urge you today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. 
Today, if the Spirit speaks to you, in these next moments, if the Spirit of God speaks to you, don't harden your heart. Say, yes, Lord. Respond. Open your heart. Yield. Because God wants to draw you back tonight. Because God wants to spare you from death. Because one year down the line, or five years down the line, or 20 years down the line, you don't know where you'll end up if you continue on the course you're on. I always challenge people and ask them, if you continue to develop the way you've been developing spiritually in your walk with God the last six months, the last year, if you continue on that path for a year, for five years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, where you will end up in heaven or in hell? We've all heard about the, the situations where, where a plane just deviates from its course just one little degree or, or a missile just one little degree and it stays on it and soon enough it's in enemy territory a plane being shot down, or a missile missing its mark. Just that one wrong pattern. When you keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it, you find that you've strayed. But it may be one step at a time. Which direction are your steps taking you? These last days, these last weeks, these last months, these last years, which direction are they taking you? Closer to Jesus or further from him? Deeper in prayer, deeper in the word, deeper in devotion to him or further from him? This is not a matter of God sitting up in heaven with a chart looking at your life saying, prayed one hour and one minute today. Good, they, they got their hour in. Prayed 59 and a half minutes. Well, they don't get credit for anything because they didn't get the hour. It's not a matter of that. It's a matter of we spend time with the one we love. It's a matter of we do the things that are most important to us. It's a matter of when something is crucial and central to us, we give it our attention. What we do will ultimately reflect what's going on in our hearts. As I said earlier, right attitudes will lead to right actions. Have you forsaken your first love? Are you backsliding? Was there a time in your life when you met the Lord or maybe at a time of personal revival, pressing into God, being mightily touched by Him, where your whole life was characterized as being Jesus-centered? We're going to work each day that work was secondary, and the main thing was just wanting to be with the Lord and be a witness, and you couldn't wait for your lunch break because you're going to take out the Word and read, and maybe one of your coworkers would come over and say, hey, man, what are you reading? And you get to witness to him? And now work, man, work is your God, work is your life, this job. Could it be that God gave you a joy in serving him there? God gave you a joy in that job. God gave you a joy in that school. God gave you a joy in that community service. But little by little by little by little, the thing took the place of God. Let me ask you a question. When's the last time you had a quality hour alone with God? When's the last time you just shut the doors, shut out the outside world, said nothing else is going to interfere, and you just sought the face of God. And it wasn't just a crisis where you were praying for a financial miracle or someone's healing or deliverance of your kid. You just wanted to get with God. You just wanted to be with the Lord. You just wanted to enjoy His presence. For some, you used to do it every single day of your life. For some, if a day went by without that time alone with God, you'd feel worse than if you hadn't slept through the night. You'd feel it more than if you hadn't eaten in a week. You'd feel so deprived. You'd feel so empty. I remember as our first daughter, Jennifer, was growing up, just, just a, a little baby now, now a few weeks old, a few months old, little by little getting older. Now a year old, year and a half old, now we have our second child. And every day when I would work, I, I, I'd see the, the kids in the morning, I'd see Jen in the morning, or if I left real early and, and maybe didn't see her in the morning, I was always home before she went to sleep at night. So every day of her early life, I wasn't traveling then, I wasn't preaching on the road or anything like that. Every day of her life, those first months, that first year, that first year and a half, as far as I could recall, there was not a single day that I missed seeing her, either in the morning or in the night, or spending a good part of the day together with her. I remember one particular day I had to work way, way out, far from my house, more than 70 miles from my home. And I got up early in the morning to get out there in time. I was in sales and traveling around just in my area. And by the time I got home, she had fallen asleep. And, and, and I remember just feeling like I missed a day. I'm sure it has not left any lasting scars on her. But in my heart, it was like, 
oh, a day went by. I didn't have that time with her. I didn't get to see her. I didn't get to play with her. Some of you used to be like that with Jesus. Man, I didn't have my time alone with the Lord. It was, it was almost like a catastrophe to you. Yeah, you had to fight off a sense of condemnation. Maybe you had some weak areas there. Maybe you didn't fully understand the understanding of God towards you, but it was your heart towards Him. You couldn't wait to get to service at night. You, 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 you hate it when the worship stopped. Why do they have to stop? We were just going after God, man. It was so wonderful. And those songs expressing my heart and the joy I'd feel. I remember as I first started learning the hymns as a, as a new believer, that a lot of them were about the Lord. He is this, he is this, he is this. And, and the moment I got deeper in worship, I didn't do it automatically. I had to just kind of step over a line where I just felt a little closer, a little more intimate in worship. But I would always change it from he to you. I'd always begin singing directly to the Lord because I couldn't sing about him anymore. And I would just change the words because it reflected my heart. Man, you used to love to worship. And someone would come over to your home and there'd always be praise and worship music in the background because you just love the atmosphere of it. And you wouldn't even know it. You just kind of catch yourself kind of caught up just worshiping, maybe doing your household chores, maybe driving in your car and you'd have that, that tape in there and you'd just be caught up. Next thing you know, man, I've driven, I've driven 10 miles. I've just been worshiping God with my eyes closed. No, just kidding. <laughs> But now the only sound that you hear in the background is the sound of the TV blaring or some secular talk show that has your interest. It may be a clean talk show, it may be wholesome, maybe dealing with some important political issues. It's not a sin to listen to those things. I'm just talking about the attitude of your heart. I'm talking about something that was there that's not there anymore. I'm talking about forsaking your first love. I started college and oh, it was so hard, so hard to study other subjects. I just wanted to read the word, read the word, read the word, read the word, read the word. I'd read these other textbooks and these other things and oh, it was difficult for me to do it. I figured out ways just to get through the classes as best I could without having to read the textbooks. Because I just wanted to read the word, everything else seemed like a distraction. But by the time I got out of college and started grad school, I was so absorbed in these other studies. God was calling me into the studies, but I was so absorbed with them. They had so taken my heart that it was difficult for me to just read the word to dive in and hear from God because I was studying languages and I wanted to, to study them in the original and, and, and read the Hebrew and understand it better and learn the Greek and so on and read it in these other translations. And, and, and I got so caught up with that, that that earlier zeal, memorizing scriptures day and night, and then I'd, I'd drive in my car and I'd quote verses as I drove, or I'd, I'd walk to the bus stop just quoting whole chapters of scripture by memory, and so excited about the word, and just telling people, man, have you heard these verses? Have you read these verses? I found it's a good way to check the condition of your heart to see if there's backsliding setting in by getting alone with God, getting on your knees and reading Psalm 119 out loud. You say, because it's a long psalm? No, not because it's a long psalm. That's really backslidden. I was telling a friend about some kids, these two boys, their dad was just stunned one day. They gave him sandwiches for lunch, and they just began to eat the sandwiches. And he said, boys, you didn't pray. They said, yeah, but it's not hot. Well, that's not why you pray, because the food is hot. I'm not saying read Psalm 119 on your knees to see if you can take stand on your knees that long. No, I'm not saying that. But as you read the words out loud, and, and you, you begin to hear yourself saying the words, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I delight in your decrees, I will not neglect your word. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. Your statutes are my delight, they are my counselors. 
on and on and on. I hold fast to your statutes. I run in the path of your commands, for you have set my heart free. The law from your mouth is more precious to me than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. Charles Spurgeon said that there's enough dust on some of our Bibles that we could write the word damnation with our fingertips on it. Remember the words of a great Keith Green song, you love the world and you're avoiding me. My word sits there upon your desk, but you love your books and magazines the best. I, I've challenged myself sometimes, said, look at what you're doing. Not that it's a sin to read a, a magazine if the magazine itself is clean and wholesome. Not that it's a sin to read another book. I've got a massive library of books. I love to read. I love to study. I love to dive in. I grow in God through these things. I'm challenged through them. But sometimes I've consciously, not out loud articulated, but consciously reached for the other book because I just wasn't interested in the Word. I'm teaching it, I'm preaching it, I'm quoting it, I'm writing it. Not writing the Bible, okay? If you're here and you're a critic of the revival after five years, yes, we believe here that we are writing a brand new Bible. It will be the Mike Brown, John Kilpatrick, Steve Hill, Lendl Cooley, Brownsville Revival Bible. It is our own version. We're making it up because we don't believe the real Bible. That was just in case someone wants a, a wrong quote. Forgive me for having fun. Bless those that are sincere and seeking the truth. Amen? Amen. But I mean, I, I'm, I'm constantly quoting scripture as I'm writing. I'm writing about the word. I'm challenging people to follow the word. And sometimes, I, I've gone to have lunch somewhere, and, and I, I look in the back seat, the car there, and I think, okay, I've got this magazine I just got. I've got this scholarly journal here. I've got the Bible. Why don't I take the Word? I've got my Hebrew Bible here. Why don't I go in and just meditate on some of the Psalms over lunch, and, and I think I'll take this other thing. And it's not because I'm so mentally weary. It's not because I need a break. It's a sign of a lack of love for the Word. It's a sign of something wrong. You can tell something's wrong in your relationship with God when the quality and the depth isn't there anymore. You know in an earthly relationship, you've ever seen two people in a room, the room can be filled, but, but they're lovebirds. There was a friend of mine in college named Lou, just the sweetest, guileless Christian young man, a great guy on fire for the Lord. We were over at his apartment one time having some fellowship with friends. His mom and dad were there and, and their apartment, and, and we were all having fellowship. And he had met a young lady at college. They ended up getting married. And I never saw eyes this big in my life. It was just amazing. I, I'm going into the next room to get a glass of water. I'll be right back. I mean, you're talking about two feet. I'll be right back. Okay, come right back. I'll be right back. Okay, okay, these big eyes. Didn't matter who else was in the room. I'd like you to meet my friend, King so-and-so, and, and his wife, Queen so-and-so. Hi, nice to meet you. I'll, I'll, be right, I'll be right over there sitting there, okay? They're just focused. As we watched at, at the wedding here, just a couple of weeks ago, as Charity and Jeremiah were married, and we could see from our angle Charity just gazing in her husband-to-be's eyes. And Nancy said to me, my wife said to me, it's just like Megan and Ryan, our, our younger daughter and her husband, when they got married. Steve Hill said during that wedding that, that, that he wanted to just say, Megan, look at me, I'm talking. You know, just, just get your eyes off, just because they're in love. But you know, some of you have been married 30 years. Honey, what? It's not quite what it used to be. The, the, the devotion, the... Well, I didn't think that would apply to anybody here, man. I, I was just joking. I was being silly. Pay attention to me. I'm, I'm paying attention. I'm listening. I can do two things at once. That's the way we are with Jesus. It used to be that we could really concentrate in prayer. It used to be that, that we could get with the Lord. And you might have to fight through the first few minutes, but, but after a while, you'd be caught up with Him. You'd be really focused. You'd be really crying out. You'd be really seeking His face. You'd be really meeting with Him. And then if the phone would ring, it would, it would be, oh, 
I, I can't bother with that. And then someone would come on the answering machine and begin to talk and realize, oh, this is important. Oh, Jesus, I'll, I'll be right back. Just stay right. I'll be right back, Lord. One little say, I'll be right back. I mean, that's how you felt. And now to even concentrate, now to even have 10 solid minutes in an hour. There was a Scottish Presbyterian minister, Moody Stewart. I've often quoted him. He, he had three rules for prayer, and his first rule was pray until you pray. We can go through an hour, we can go through two hours, go through the motions. Our mind has been everywhere. Our heart has been everywhere. And we've been doing 20 other things in the meantime. The devotion's gone. See, with devotion comes discipline, because you care, because it's meaningful, because it's serious. You might not get up in the middle of the night for yourself. You might not get up if you're a little hungry in the middle of the night, you think, oh, I don't need to eat, it's better that I don't, I can live without it. I don't need that to get a drink of water right now, or I'll, I'll just wait until the morning. But when it's somebody else, somebody's sick, and you need to check on them every hour or every two hours, you have a discipline because your devotion. When that alarm goes off, you jump right up because you care about that person. You can look at your life in general in terms of discipline. Generally speaking, lack of self-control in one area of life is symptomatic of lack of self-control in other areas of life. Generally speaking, if you open the door to the flesh in one way, you'll find that you begin to open the door to the flesh in other ways. You begin to find an inability to fast, an inability to, to be disciplined in things you used to be disciplined in, an inability to say no to certain things that you used to say no to. It's a sign of backsliding. It's a sign of leaving your first love. Some brothers in a congregation once were recommending a book that taught men how to deal thoroughly and effectively with the sin of pornography and sexual sin in general, with focusing on pornography. And I was curious to see the things that were taught there. Thank God it was an area where I was struggling or it had a problem in the Lord. But I wanted to see the counsel because I'm always preaching repentance and holiness and challenging myself and the Lord to go deeper. I was curious to see what principles they talked about there. And one of the things that interested me was they talked about general discipline in diet. In other words, if you're gonna be disciplined in your thought life, you're gonna to have to be disciplined in other ways. And discipline in one part of life will carry over into other parts of life. Could be there's no discipline. There's no discipline to focus on the Word and, and, and really get into it and, and, and get your mind to look at it. Some of you may have a physical illness that's creating problems for you or something that's going on in your life. You can't sleep, and because of that, you can't focus. I'm not heaping more condemnation on you. You feel bad enough already. I'm talking to those who really, we have no excuse except the fact that we're backsliding, that little by little by little, even if we never go over this edge, even if we never take that fall, that plunge, where we turn our backs on God, how terrible it would be to lose the one life that we have, the one opportunity that we have to do something lasting for the Master. Dear godly German Christian woman, bold during the Holocaust, Basilea Schlink, just made a simple statement. Think of what you're losing, both for time and eternity, if you love Jesus with only half a heart. What a loss. If he's God, then follow him. If he's Lord, then give yourself to him. If the blood of Jesus is real, then dive in with abandon and say, my life for the master. Hardness of heart comes gradually. It's not a sudden thing. I was talking to folks recently and they were talking about some problems that had set in their lives and I said, well, what happened? It's everything we've written. It's, it's every textbook item. There are some people who will continue to live holy and committed lives while backsliding in devotion. They've learned to live certain ways and they don't like the way they used to live and they want to please the Lord, but the relational end is going down, 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 down. And ultimately, it will affect you in terms of sin. 
in terms of holiness, in terms of purity. When I wrote the book, Go and Sin No More, I put a whole chapter in the book called Have You Forsaken Your First Love? Understanding that many people fall into sin only after the heart begins to backslide gradually. My mom's cousin in England told me this when I was a boy. He was having problems with his foot. He had a severe case of gout, and was in terrible pain. And when it cleared up, he just told the doctor, you know, something's funny. Something's just funny with my, I believe it was his right big toe. He said, something's just funny with my toe. And the doctor checked him out and to his shock found that there was a pin that had gone right into his toe, broken off, and the pin was just upright, standing vertically, going right up to his, to his nail, and thankfully got lodged there and didn't enter into his bloodstream or anything like that where it could have potentially killed him. But he never remembered stepping on it. You know why? He was in such severe pain. Think of this. He was in such severe pain because of the gout that when he stepped on the pin, he didn't even notice an increase in pain. I never forgot that. See, we're not always the best judges of things. Our senses are not always the best judges of things. I always tell people that, that we use a, an adjustable measuring rod for ourselves. We either condemn something in one person's life but justify it in our own life. Pastor of a church who doesn't like, we don't like falls, man, I always knew he was wicked. Pastor of a church who like falls, all oh, God will restore him, God will have compassion. Double standards, we do the same with ourselves. We can't always judge things accurately. I heard that Abe Lincoln, who was a tall man, very tall for his day, was once asked, how tall are you? And he said, just tall enough that when my, I stand up, my feet touch the ground. See, that's as tall as each of us are, just that tall. You, you're not an accurate measurer all the time. Hardness comes in little by little by little by little to the point that we don't notice things anymore. And I was talking to these folks and they said, well, First thing, my prayer life began to go down. My time alone with God began to go down. My time in the Word began to go down. And then next thing, I started to listen to some things I, I shouldn't listen to, some wrong music I, I shouldn't listen to. Then I started watching some movies with profanity and violence. And the first time I heard some of the profanity, it was like a knife going through me. But after a little while, it didn't bother me anymore. The fact that something doesn't bother you may be the scariest thing of all, friend. That doesn't bother me. That doesn't mean it doesn't bother the Lord. It may not bother you because your heart's become hard. It may not bother you because you've never gotten close enough to Jesus to really hear his heart. Textbook, classic, just the same thing. Little by little, neglecting our time alone with God. Little by little, hardness coming in. Little by little, we're becoming sensitive to sin. Ephesians 4 goes through the process. Pagans, unbelievers, not following God, giving themselves over to every kind of sin. Why? Because of the hardness in their hearts. They've lost all insensitivity. That thing doesn't bother me anymore. The fact that you don't feel convicted doesn't necessarily mean anything. If God's spoken it, if God's made it plain, he never has to convict. I don't, want, I don't feel any conviction about stealing from the store. You don't have to feel conviction. It's written. Lo tignov, do not steal. I, I, don't, I don't feel any conviction about this affair or this adultery. It's written, lo tignov, do not commit adultery. You don't need to feel any conviction. God dealt with me years ago in 1982 about watching boxing and being entertained by boxing. That was my favorite sport. I, I love to watch boxing. And God convicted me and God dealt with me that it was wrong to be entertained by violence. You say, do you believe that's universal? Yes, I do, but you take it between you and God. I'll tell you what I believe, but you take it between you and God. But, but listen, listen. In the years since, every so often I've watched a little boxing and I never felt any conviction. I would have thought I would have been smitten. I would have thought, I would have said, how can I do it? Didn't bother me. And I thought, my God, that's scary. God spoke once, he doesn't have to speak again. 
God convicted me once, clearly. I'm not talking about, is that you, Lord? I mean, clearly. He didn't have to convict me again. If I've ever watched a minute of it, it's been wrong. Hardness comes in. First time you hear those jokes, they just so, they're so offensive. Now they don't seem like anything. A friend was telling me he used to live in a community where everybody around him, just bikini-clad women and men, barely dressed. And he said it hardly ever dawned on him at all to look at any of the women. Maybe someone topless would get his attention a little bit. Why? Because he was so holy? No, he was just used to the environment. He was hardened. He said, now just someone in short shorts, I mean, he's got to guard his eyes, look away. Why? He's become sensitive. It was a time when the fire wasn't burning as brightly in his heart. When it began to burn brightly, a sensitivity came. I remember one time I had gone away to seek the Lord for about three and a half or four days. And I was praying in the middle of it, should I, should I just go out and have a meal? I was debating it, and I thought, okay, I'm just going to go out and have a meal. just want to eat now, and then I fasted the, the end part of it. But maybe it was the middle of the second day. I thought, I'm just going to go have a meal, and then, then I'll seek the Lord in fasting. And I was just alone with God, just day and night. There was a room with a mattress and a chair, and that was it. Just seeking God, praying and reading the Word. And, and I went out to this place right downstairs where I could get a meal. And just being around other human beings, hearing them talk to each other, hearing families talk to each other, hearing the, the speech, I was just, oh, it felt absolutely miserable. Normally, I'm around that all the time. I don't think anything of it. But I've been so close to the Lord and so much caught up in His presence that all this stuff just seems so vulgar and coarse. Hardness comes in little by little by little by little. Oh, that, that, that doesn't bother me. See, the guy that once found Playboy very tempting, after a little while, he's got to go to something harder, something more hardcore, something more perverse, something uglier, and maybe even have to start to act the things out and live the things out. Why? Hardness of heart. When I wrote Go and Sin No More, I laid out 20 reasons not to sin. And the first ones, we've, we've seen all of them, but the first ones over and over again. The same principle, sin doesn't satisfy. Instead, it leads to more sin, and then it leads to worse sin, and then it enslaves, and you watch it happen over and again. The heart gets hard. Young people growing up, watch the decisions you make. And I'm almost done here. The young people, in particular, watch the decisions you make. You may be wearing outfits today that when you first saw people wearing those outfits, you said, that's lewd, that's, man, that's unchristian. They claim to be Christians. How come they're dressed like that? And now you dress like that. You say, I'm more mature. No, you're harder. You just made the same foolish decisions they did. You have to ask yourself, are you doing things today? Brothers, sisters, you may be 70 years old, you may be 10 years old, but hear me. Are you doing things today? Are you watching things? Are you entertained by things? Are there things in your life, prayerlessness set in, other oh, sin, lack of witness, lack of heart for the lost, and, and, and you're an extreme case right now. Or you're doing certain things that, that if I asked you two years ago, would you be watching this? You'd say, I'd never watch this. Would you be doing this? I'd never do this. Would you be praying this little? Never. Would you go this long without sharing your faith? Never. And now you're doing all those things. I ask you a question, how can you be so sure of what's coming in two more years? If you've compromised standards now that you were sure two years ago you wouldn't have compromised, if you've fallen away in certain ways now that two years ago or one year ago you would have guaranteed me when you were at this revival before I'd never go that way, you're doing it all the time, who knows what's coming next? I first got high as an unsafe person. I'll never do anything more than that. Never do anything more than smoke pot, smoke hash. Next thing I'm doing, LSD and barbiturates and ups and those kinds of things. Pills. I'll never do anything more than that. Next thing I'm doing, speed. I'll never shoot speed. Next thing I'm shooting speed. I'll never shoot heroin. Next thing I'm shooting heroin. And that was just from the age of 14 to 15. How do you know what's coming next if you've already done things that you would have guaranteed me you'd never do? There used to be a heart for the lost. You used to really believe people were lost. It used to grieve you. It used to hurt you. Now it's just a religious truth. There's heaven, there's hell, there's lost, there's say We have outreach, we have missions. It's just business. What's happened? You're forsaken, your first love. 
Some of you here are enslaved now. Some of you, no one know it from looking at, looking at your worship. No one would know it from the outside, but some of you here are enslaved. Maybe listening by radio. You're enslaved now. You used to be free. You used to be so free. Even though life had problems and it's going to have problems, even though there were difficulties and challenges, even though your emotions would go up and down, and you had your bad days, and we all do, you were free. Now you're enslaved. Now there are things that control you. Now there are things in your life that you're ashamed of. Bad news is, the Lord says, I have this against you. You've forsaken your first love. But even in that, there's good news because he still cares enough to tell you I have this against you. He doesn't just say, hey, you have a nice life. I hope it works out or get out of here. I never want to see you. He says, look, change things. Even as I pray tonight, Lord, as we draw near to you, hearing your word, draw near to us, I was conscious of the fact that he's drawn near first. He's come near first. He's calling us. He's pulling on us first. He says, remember the height from which you've fallen. It was real. It was real. It was real. It was real. You were really there. You did really walk like that. Remember the height from which you've fallen. Repent. Recognize it as sin, turn away from it, turn back to God, and do the first works. And I close here. If you go back and do the things you did at first, the relationship will be restored. You know, broken relationship with husband and wife, what do they need to do? Go back to the early days. The days of romance, the days of courtship, the days of doing special little things for each other, the days of clearing hours in a day just to spend together. The days of putting one another first. You see one of your kids getting estranged and distant. You realize you've been so busy, you've been neglecting them. You just shut down other things except for the essentials, and you pour yourself into those kids, and they just begin to blossom. Those withering flowers begin to blossom and bud. Repent and do the first works. Remember the height from which you've fallen. Jesus is here, ready to restore, ready to forgive, even the most shameful, ugly, despicable things, because that's the real danger sign. That's the real, real danger sign, that you've done some things that you never would have dreamed you'd do, that you've opened some doors you never would have dreamed you've opened, that you're this close to doing something that would be suicidal spiritually. You can't believe it's happened. That's the real danger sign. And for some, this is a last warning from God before you take that plunge. Just as I've met young ladies and going to pray, minister to them in a church service, the next thing this burden comes over me, and I'm warning them, I don't even know them, warning them about a sinful relationship that's right there knocking at the door, and they, they start to cry, and they said, there's this guy I've been going with, I know it's wrong, I know it's sin, and I said, the Lord's warning you, and they cry and they weep. I remember it happened several straight times in a period of just a few months, they cry and they weep, and next thing they're pregnant. 15 years old, 17 years old, God was warning them. says this in James chapter 5, a wonderful verse, a wonderful promise. My brothers, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring him back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Everyone stand to your feet, please. Father, I pray you cause this word to hit home deeply in every heart. Bring radical change. Meet us at this altar in Jesus' name. Amen. If God's speaking to you through this message, I want you to come right now. Get on your knees before the Lord. If God's speaking to you through this message, come on. If you've never known Jesus, if you've never known him the way we're talking about, or if you've seen clearly signs of backsliding, come on, right now. The Lord's not here to condemn you. The Lord's here to bless you. Maybe you've never missed a revival service in five years, and you realize I've been backsliding. Come on, get up as close as you can. Jesus, Jesus, for some there was that faith, there was that boldness, there was that holy aggression, and man, we just went for it. We're like a shell of who we used to be. Come on, friend. Lord Jesus, get up as close as you can. Can't get any closer to kneel down in the aisles. Jesus, change us. Take us back, Lord. Save those here who don't know you. 
Come on, there are a number of others. God's speaking to you, God's dealing with you. Humble yourself. Humble yourself. Jesus, do you really know him, sir? Do you really know him, ma'am? Is he really your all in all? Oh, I know we have responsibilities in this world. I know we have interests. And I get excited about the things the Lord lets me do. But he's the source of it. He's the center of it. Are you backsliding? Are your standards falling? Are you doing things now you didn't dream you'd do before? Have you lost the consciousness and the conviction of sin? Is the burden gone? Is the devotion gone? Is it waning and waning and waning and waning and waning? Some of you here aren't coming forward. Let me speak to you directly by the leading of the Lord. People burned you, people disappointed you. You put walls up and you know coming forward means you're gonna have to forgive, you're gonna have to get right, you're gonna have to humble yourself, you're gonna have to ask forgiveness. Step out, that's you. Step out, God's speaking to you. Step out, doesn't matter what it's gonna cost. Nothing's more important than restoring your relationship with Jesus. Don't insult the spirit of grace. This may be the only word you hear from God like this in the next 10 years. And the next you hear it, you may be laying in the gutter somewhere and someone who is at this service will be talking to you about Jesus, never dreaming that you're in that same meeting with them. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Kneel down in the aisles, but step out of your pew and get right. Jesus, pray, pour your heart out to God. Let him do surgery on you. I'm coming back to the heart of worship when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made. It's all about you. It's all about you. heart out to him. He's near to the brokenhearted. Get it all out. If you're ashamed, get it all out. If the compromising is so embarrassing, get it all out. Or if it's just been so subtle, you can't believe what God's uncovered tonight, get it all out. Leave it all at this altar. Let him wash you clean. You leave here sparkling tonight. You can leave here not just restored, but closer to him than you've ever been before. Jesus, spend some time before the Lord. When the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come Longing just to bring something that's a word that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. Search much deeper within through the way things are you're looking into my heart. 
Matthew Henry said believers who have left their first love must return and do their first works. They must, as it were, begin again, go back step by step till they come to the place where they took the first false step. They must endeavor to revive and recover their first zeal, tenderness and seriousness and must pray as earnestly and watch as diligently as they did when they first set out in the ways of God. That's the one side of it. The other side of it is God making himself more real to you. I want you to appeal to him at this altar. In fact, let's sing, draw me close to you. I want you to appeal to him at this altar, every eye closed. Lord, make yourself so real to me. In your own words, just ask him to make himself more real to you again, to, to make his word more real to you, his spirit more real to you, his reality deeper and deeper in your life so that when you just see him afresh, nothing else will matter. Nothing else will matter. Before this night's out, we're gonna lay hands on every single one of you and ask for a fresh anointing and a fresh touch of God. And God's gonna kiss your soul. Some of you will know that there's an immediate radical change. Others will see this something fresh building and growing in the days that come. Oh, mighty one, let this be a turning point. There are warriors here. There's some that the enemy was ready to pick off. I know it. There are some that were ready to take that false step there's some, oh God, that have been heading on a path so contrary to your calling. Now they're going to be soldiers in your army. Lord, they were heading on a path to death. They were heading on a point, path to disappointment. They were heading on a path, oh God, so far from you. Now you're restoring their souls, oh God. Now they're going to be history makers and world changers. Jesus. Stretch out your hand and touch and go deep, 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 deep in every heart and pull out the crowd. And draw us close to you, Lord. Draw us close to you, Jesus. Jesus. Draw me close to you. Never let me go. I lay it all down again To hear you say that I'm your friend You are my desire Nothing else could take your place To feel the warmth of your embrace and Help me find the way Bring me back to you
are my desire No one else will do Cause nothing else could take your place that didn't need to come up because you say, man, this is my heart. This is how I've been living. I want you to invite others. I know there's not room at the altar, but step out of your pew where you are and join them in the aisles. And let's just press in deeper. Just step out from where you are. If you say, man, what you preach, that's my heart tonight. Let's join the others that are up here before we pray. Jesus, and let's just begin to worship him. Let's begin to express our love for him again. Jesus, if you got a friend that's up here at this altar or a family member and you just want to come, put your arm around them. Not drive demons out of them or lay hands on them in some formal way, but you just want to join them. Put your arm around them and love on them and pray together. You go ahead and join them. That's all right. Jesus. Only a friend or family member. Don't go up to a stranger. Jesus. Jesus. Sing it from the beginning. Draw me close to you. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Draw me close to you. Touch us tonight, Lord. Change us. Never let me go. Do a new work. Do a new work. I lay it all down again. Do a new work, Jesus. To hear you say that I am free. Something fresh. Something fresh. You are my desire. Something fresh from heaven. Your work. No one else Jesus. will do. Because nothing else could take your place. To feel the warmth of your Find a way, bring me back to you, yes, Jesus. You're all I want. 
Jesus. Say out loud to the Lord, change me tonight. Forgive me tonight, Lord. Remove the hardness. Remove the insens insensitivity. Take away everything that stands between us. I want to know you like I've never known you before. I want to go beyond my first love. And Lord, if I've never really known you, make yourself real to me tonight. Jesus, you died for me. You paid for all my sins. You rose from the dead. I confess you as my Savior, my Lord, my King, my friend. This night, I turn away from every sin, from everything displeasing, and I give myself to you, spirit, soul, and body. Here I am. Love me, Lord. Fill me, Lord. Reveal yourself to me, Lord. Touch me, Lord. Use me, Lord. Send me, Lord. Jesus, do it. Jesus, do it. Jesus, do it. Jesus, do it in every life. Save this night. Restore this night. Heal this night. Set free this night. Jesus, 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 Lord of all.